Hello my friends, it's Lisa and today I'm going to be reading five popular book talk books and seeing if I agree with their popularity, if I enjoy them as much as everyone else. I have read a variety of books that are considered book talk books or book talk sensations. All of those books that have the book talk sticker, you know the ones. I have read a variety of them in the past few years before book talk was even a thing, but I definitely have a lot of mixed feelings on some of these popular book talk books. Some of them I love, some of them I do not like at all, and some of them I kind of feel pretty neutral on. So I thought it would be fun to read some more, see if I could determine what it is from book talk that I can take as recommendations, if there's certain genres, certain authors that I want to try out because of book talk. So yeah, I'm going to be reading five different hyped book talk books in this video, and I kind of picked from genres that I typically like to read from anyways. I have some fantasy, some romance, I have a fantasy romance here, I even have one that probably is considered more of a mystery, so definitely have a variety-ish of genres, but genres that I love, so I thought that that would be a good place to start. And there's even a book on this TBR that I have said on multiple occasions that I never wanted to read, but book talk is just that powerful. So I read it for this video and it was just, it was very interesting experience reading all of these books. Definitely have a lot of thoughts and opinions on a lot of these books. So I think that's it. I'm just going to let you get into the vlog where I read these five popular book talk books. I am looking a little rough, but I'm here for my first update with From Blood and Ash. I think I'm about, yeah, I'm 43% of the way through the ebook for From Blood and Ash. And so far, I mean, I'm almost halfway through the book. And so far, I'm not, I'm not vibing with it. I'm not really enjoying it. I really thought that this was going to be a book that could go either way for me. I really could see myself enjoying it, but also not enjoying it. Like, I really wasn't sure what way I was gonna go and turns out I'm not loving it. That's what's happening. <laughs> I think the biggest thing for me is the writing and I'm not someone that like I've read books with writing that's like not great like I can recognize that maybe it's not the best but I will still enjoy the book because of the characters or the plot or whatever it may be whereas this book I find like because of not enjoying a lot of the other things that the writing bothering me is like taking me out of the story and it's actually noticeable and it's like distracting me from enjoying the rest of the story. I think one thing is that there's an excessive use of ellipses. Is that the plural of ellipses? I don't know. But <laughs> basically she'll be, the main character Poppy will be talking or even like it happens like in her inner monologue, like in her thoughts where she'll be like, but dot dot dot, but, and then continue on. And it happens so often that it's actually like taking me out of the story now that it's happening so often and now that I've noticed it. Also, I didn't really explain what this book is about, but to be honest, I don't even really fully understand it myself, which is another problem I'm having is I feel like the first half of this book has been pretty info dumpy, but still not giving me the info that I actually need. I feel like it's been info dumpy with things that I don't need to know. And I'm getting confused on like what seems like the bigger things, the bigger things about the characters and this world, like I still don't fully understand. It's like taken me a while to kind of understand them or just I still don't know. So it's been weird. It's been this weird mix of like somehow overwhelmingly info dumpy, but I still don't understand anything that's going on. <laughs> so let me see if I can explain. You're following Poppy, who is the maiden, which means she was chosen by the gods. I don't even fully understand, but we're just going to move on. And so basically she lives a very like solitary life. She can't really like make connections with a lot of people. And then she meets Hawk, which we'll get to that in a second. But she meets him and he becomes her like personal guard. And there's some, you know, sexual tension, but it's also like she can't really be with him because she's not supposed to. And that's really what I've gathered so far. There's been some other like some other world building things, I guess, that I've learned. But that's like the main premise. And going back to Hawk, the first like time you see him, the first interaction our main character has with him, I found to be very uncomfortable. I don't know if it's supposed to be fine, but I'm like, to me, it felt like there was an issue of 
consent here because he thought she was someone else. And then they start making out. And I'm like, what are we, what's happening right now? And she doesn't ever really correct him. But he figures it out. But it's just like, it's still just weird to me. I don't know if I'm being a little too sensitive to it. But to me, I'm like, that was a weird interaction. (laughs) And also the main character, Poppy, I'm not loving. I find that she makes a lot of questionable decisions. Like at one point she was trying to sneak out to go and help fight against these bad things that were trying to like climb over the wall. Anyway, I would wish I could fully understand. And her like, basically her maid is telling her like, you shouldn't do it for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, like has a lot of valid reasons as to why she shouldn't be doing that. And Poppy's like, you're right. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so I'm just not having the best time. I'm not loving any, really any of the characters. I'm not really loving the plot because there really hasn't been one. I don't fully understand what's happening. And I don't think it's a me problem. I think it's a, a writing problem. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the world building is super easy to understand and it's a me thing. I don't know. So this has been a very negative update. <laughs> um, I will say Poppy is scared of spiders, which is very relatable content. So... I hope that doesn't come up later because there's a big scene with spiders because then I won't be able to read it, but it is relatable. And that's, that's it. That's all. (laughs) All right, everyone, buckle in because I got a lot to say about this book. (laughs) So I finished From Blood and Ash. Didn't love it. (laughs) I was going back and forth on my rating for a little while, but then the more I kind of thought about this book, the more I realized how much I didn't enjoy it. So... I'm gonna give it a one star. Woohoo! Starting this video out strong. <laughs> so everything that I kind of said in my first initial update was pretty true throughout the rest of the book. The writing being extremely repetitive, me just not really liking anything about it, the world building being very info dumpy, but also like none of it being the info we actually need, it just being very confusing. I feel like I still don't understand half of the things that were in this book and any of the explanations we got. (laughs) I will say the second half of this book did get a little better. That's kind of why I was sticking it out and not DNFing this book. Half because I was filming this video, but also because I heard that the second half got a lot better. I wouldn't say a lot better, but like a tiny bit better. (laughs) There was actually a plot in the second half, which can't say that for the first half. Uh, This book is like 600 pages long or something. The first 300 pages, nothing happened. It was just the weird info dumping that didn't make any sense. And I think there was kind of an event in the kind of second half that kind of moved everything else in that second half, the plot and everything forward. And I feel like that should have been towards the beginning of the book. And then the rest of the book could have been what the second half was. Like, there was no reason for this book to be over 600 pages. I'm sorry. (laughs) But even though there was more things happening in the second half, there weren't a lot of things that I was enjoying. (laughs) So it's kind of like, at least there was something happening, but I wasn't enjoying it. I think a lot of the reveals and a lot of the things that just, like, we find out in the second half are very predictable. I kind of knew that going into this book that I was gonna kind of know everything that happened. I had never been spoiled for anything in this book, but I think just the particular characters and the tropes and just like this general story, I knew exactly where it was going and I was correct. So even though the second half was again more entertaining, I knew exactly what was going on. So it was like, "Mm, it wasn't more entertaining. I don't know. Speaking of all the like the reveals and everything, Poppy is not a smart character and I don't even feel bad saying it. You can't even get mad at me because she even says it. She calls herself dumb. She calls herself an imbecile like multiple times and she's right. (laughs) It's the first time she said something that I was like, exactly, so true. (laughs) There was a part where I felt briefly bad for her, which I can't really say without getting into spoilers, but it didn't really last long. I just, if she was just even the slightest bit smarter, I think she would have been able to figure out everything that was going on. There was just like so many signs, like someone literally was saying something right in front of her and she was like, but that doesn't make sense. (laughs) It's like, yeah. And why doesn't that make sense, bestie? Like, think it through. (laughs) A big thing with, I think, book talk wrecks in general, but also like this book in particular is the smut, the spicy scenes. People on book talk love their spicy books. Good for them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the smut in this book. I didn't find it too bad. Like, I think I was expecting it to be a lot more cringy and just like not good. And it wasn't terrible. Just the excessive use of the word honeydew. Knock it off. That did not need to be (laughs) said by that man so many times. (laughs) I think my biggest thing with the smut is like the context behind a lot of those scenes. 
wasn't in it for me. And this is when I feel like I have to get a little spoilery. So I'm going to put a timestamp in the description so you can avoid spoilers if you don't want to be spoiled for this book. But I also will write spoilers on the screen so you can kind of just skip ahead until that disappears. So I just think like the smut itself was just very oddly timed in the sense that like you find out Hawk is betraying her, basically, and before that they had had sex, and it's like, wow, he was completely deceiving her, but like, you're supposed to think like, no, the that was real, his love for her is real, but it's like, it's still weird to me <laughs> that he was completely lying to her. But anyway, but then the one that really got me was when she finds out that he is the Dark One, that Hawk was lying, that he's the Dark One, which like, couldn't even fully explain what that means. I just know he's like a bad man that is not very nice. <laughs> she finds out that he is the Dark One, the person behind so many of her family and friends' deaths, the reason why so many people she cared about have died, whether it's by his hand or his influence, she has been impacted by so many of his actions in a negative way. And she says this multiple times, half because the writing is repetitive, but it's like she knows that he is not a nice man. She finds that out, tries to stab him in the heart, but he's immortal, of course, so he didn't die. But she went from trying to kill him and running away to a minute later, they're having sex. What? <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't get it. It's just also weird because I feel like Poppy is very confused and feeling very like betrayed, but also she still has feelings for him and she's just having such mixed emotions. She's learning all this new information and it's just like, that's when we decide to have sex with him. Like it's just, it is so bizarre to me. Like it's so weird. It just felt like, why is this what we're doing right now? <laughs> And then because after they have sex, she's still like not trusting of him. She still is like unsure of him. And it's like, what? I just don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand. <laughs> also, while we're in the spoilery section, I do want to kind of go back to what I was saying earlier about like how I felt briefly bad for her. I did feel bad when she felt really betrayed by him. And like she was saying, like, I finally like kind of opened up to someone and trusted someone with so many of my feelings and my thoughts. And this is what happened. And I did feel, I did feel a little bad for her in that moment, but she's also still really stupid. So <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay, no longer talking about spoilers, but I did want to bring this up. I was watching Hannah from a Clockwork Readers video where she read from Blood and Ash. And first of all, everything she said, hard agree. But also she brought up a TikTok from Marinez, who I'll have the TikTok linked below. And she was basically explaining like the two characters of color in this book are given names that describe their skin color. So we have a character named Tawny, which that is a like descriptor of a like orangey brown color. And she's also like a maid, which... <laughs> and then we have Kieran and that name means like dark or like dark haired or like black haired or something. And there's more to his character that I feel like could count as spoilers. So I won't say, but there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So yeah, overall, didn't have a very good time. Nothing made sense. Very repetitive, info dumpy writing. I never want to see an ellipsis ever again. <laughs> and I mean, we had smut, but at what cost? Because I didn't like anything else about it. I didn't like the context behind the smut. It just, no, no. Plus there was that like questionable consent, right? At like chapter two, I should have known that that was a sign to stop, but oh well, I didn't. <laughs> So yeah, this was not my favorite book that I've ever read. I am rating it one star. Didn't have a good time. But um, if any of you have fantasy romance recommendations that isn't this series, let me know. Okay, so I wanted to update on the next book for this vlog, which is The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. I'm finally reading this book. <laughs> I'm not super far. I also feel like, do I really need to give a synopsis for this book? I feel like everyone knows what all of these books are about by now, but basically what I've read so far, we're following Olive who starts fake dating this professor who's not her professor. He doesn't like, he's not involved with her at all. And the way that it's explained, it's not a big deal. She's trying to convince her friend that she should date the guy that she's interested in because he's Olive's ex and she feels weird about it, but she just wants her friend to date him. Like she doesn't care. And she sees her friend at school and just kisses the first guy that she sees. And it happens to be 
this professor, Adam Carlson. So that sets off the fake dating charade. And that's really as far as I've gotten so far. They've kind of made their plan for their fake dating. I'm only on chapter four right now. So I'm not super far, but I did want to give some initial thoughts. I definitely feel like at the beginning of this book, especially like right at the beginning, within a couple of pages, we were given that classic, like he's so big and tall and I'm so small <laughs> thing that happens a lot in romance books. So that did happen and it was like excessively, I feel like at the beginning and it's been brought up a couple of times since, but that's something that I just kind of expected <laughs> to be in this, to be honest. And it's been in a lot of other romances that I've read and enjoyed. Some I haven't, but some I have as well. So I've just kind of accepted that that's a thing that happens. But so far, other than that, I am liking it so far. It's been kind of cheesy, but there's also been some funny lines as well. Like I've actually like laughed reading a couple bits of this book. So that's good. I also do love a good fake dating moment. I don't know why, because I know exactly how it's going to play out every single time I read it. But for some reason, I just love it so much. <laughs> I just love like the drama of it. I love the like inner struggle that these characters have because they're like, oh no, I've developed real feelings for this person, but our relationship is fake. What do we do? I don't know why I love it so much because I know exactly what's going to happen, but it gets me every time. So excited to see how that all plays out in this particular book. But yeah, like I said, I'm not super far. So that's kind of my only thoughts so far. I will say I know this is based off of like a Star Wars fan fiction or like Star Wars characters. And that I don't have a problem with that at all. Like good for you whatever. As someone who reads fan fiction, I clearly do not care. It's more so the fact that it's based off of Adam Driver and the character's name in the book is literally Adam. It's like, that's a little on the nose. <laughs> it's also like, I don't particularly want to be picturing Adam Driver while reading this book, but that's more of a me problem. <laughs> They're definitely described as the characters from Star Wars, which I don't know anything about Star Wars, so apologies. But I definitely like understand that they're like described as similar, but I don't really feel like I'm picturing the actors from Star Wars. So I think it's all working out for me. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so far 20% in, yeah, 20% of the way through book. So not very far, but so far it's pretty cute, a little cheesy, but cute. And I'm excited to see how everything plays out. Well, hello friends. I wanted to update on the love hypothesis because I actually finished it probably a week ago now and I wanted to give my thoughts and I'm really excited because this vlog has definitely taken a turn for the better. We started off really bad with one star and I'm happy to say that the love hypothesis really came in clutch. I absolutely loved it. I think I'm gonna give it five stars. <laughs> it was just so much fun and just so cute and it was really funny and it made me get like butterflies in my stomach. Like I just absolutely loved it. It made me like smile so much and even just like talking about it is making me smile. Like I just really enjoyed it. I definitely think there could be things that I could be like nitpicky about but I'm simply not going to. <laughs> I just had such a good time and something I did want to talk about is I know this is like also, sorry about my frizzy hair. We're just going to ignore that. But something I wanted to talk about is I kept talking about how this was like a Star Wars fan fiction, I think, before it was published or it's it's definitely inspired by the characters from Star Wars. And I want to say that as someone who doesn't watch Star Wars, doesn't really care and didn't particularly want to picture the people from Star Wars, I didn't. I didn't picture them. I think if you really like Star Wars and you do want to picture these characters as the characters from Star Wars, you can still do that. But it also, if you are like me and you don't particularly care, you can still read it and it not be like super obvious that it's like based off of Star Wars. And this isn't me like shaming anyone for liking Star Wars or the fan fiction aspect of this book. Like I do not care. <laughs> I am someone who has read fan fiction many a time. So there's no, no shame here. I'm just saying I didn't really want to picture the people from Star Wars and I didn't. So a win. I will say there were a couple of references to Star Wars, which I thought was kind of cool, especially because it is based off of 
Star Wars. How many times have I said Star Wars in the past three minutes? <laughs> but it definitely did reference it and there weren't any like other pop culture references I don't think so if you're not a fan of that like you don't have to worry and I don't even think it mentioned Star Wars that many times like maybe twice but it was kind of like a nod to what this started out as so I do think it was really cool and it wasn't like taking itself too seriously being like no that was a fan fiction and now this is different like I thought it was just cool that it referenced the kind of inspiration behind the book. I also thought it was fun that within the book too they were like poking fun at the kind of tropes that this book had. I just thought that that was so funny and like the fact that Olive was very well aware of like the fake dating trope and kept talking about tropes and Adam was just like what are you talking about? <laughs> I just thought it was really fun and really funny. Like there was one point where they were going to a conference in Boston, which first of all, Boston, hey, what's up? I have a bone to pick <laughs> with their discussion around Boston in a minute, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but they're going to a conference in Boston and she didn't have a hotel or Airbnb because her friends got them with other people or expected her to stay with Adam. So Adam's like, you can just stay with me. And she was like, oh, but there's only gonna be one bed because she was talking about like the only one bed trope. And he's like, no, no, there's gonna be, there's gonna be two. And she's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> there's only gonna be one bed. And he's like, no, I got the confirmation email. There's a double. And he's, she's like, no, no, you don't get it. And I just thought that was so funny. Like that's probably one of my favorite parts of the whole book. Like it's still making me giggle now. <laughs> oh, and the thing about Boston that I wanted to complain about was they were talking about how she needed to like go out and do things around Boston, like go to a, an Irish pub, pretend to like the Red Sox, which you shouldn't be pretending <laughs> to like the Red Sox, but anyway. And then they were like, and go to a donkey's. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I have never heard anyone called Duncan's donkeys. <laughs> I don't know if I'm just being a bitter New Englander. <laughs> I don't even like like Dunkin' Donuts that much. I'm just like, I've never heard someone called Duncan's donkeys. And then I was just like, am I a fake New Englander? Like, do people actually call Duncan's donkeys? I don't think I've ever heard that before in my life. Other than that, it was great. I had a great time. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, I could get nitpicky, but I think I'm going to give it five stars because it, I just had such a good time. And I will say, I think this is the first five star romance I've had since the Spanish Love Deception. And I do think there's been romances that I've read in between the Spanish Love Deception like last year and this that probably could have been five stars. But I had a really hard time giving certain romances five stars since the Spanish Love Deception. I don't want to get too much into it because it's more personal and I'm still like it's still hard to talk about but the timing when I read The Spanish Love Deception I think was just perfect. I think the timing of when you read certain books can influence whether you enjoy them or not and the time when I read that book I desperately needed something that was going to make me happy but also like completely distract me and like help me escape from things going on at the time and that's exactly what that book did. I think there are certain criticisms of that book that I don't necessarily disagree with, but I think because of that book and like how much joy it brought me when I desperately needed that, I think that's why I love it so much. And I feel like every romance I've read since I've been comparing to that experience with the Spanish Love Deception and it's just not fair because I'm not in the same position as I was then. So I know it's not that serious, ratings are not that serious, so that's why I kind of was like, girly you're not in the same situation. Give this romance five stars. It was fun. It's what it deserves. So I'm giving it five stars. <laughs> I think it was just really hard for me to rate a romance five stars because I kept having the Spanish love deception on like a whole other level. And I think it was just like too much like comparing everything to the experience of reading that book and like where I was at mentally and it's just not fair and this book was good and it made me really happy and I never wanted it to be over like I literally the last two chapters I think of the book I put off reading for a little while because I was just like I don't want it to ever be over <laughs> so I think that that is a book that is deserving of five stars so now I've like broken the seal on giving another romance five stars so maybe it'll be better going forward hello <laughs> so yeah the love hypothesis five stars. I'm obsessed. I need to get a physical copy. There were even moments where I was reading this. I was like, this is going to be so much fun to reread. I would like underline this part and like annotate it. And I'm like, oh no. Like when you have those thoughts when you're not even like when you don't own the book, that's a good sign. Plus I'm a simple gal who loves fake dating. And if that's in it, it's a five star for me. <laughs> 
So it is that time for me to start the next book for this vlog, and the next book is going to be The Cruel Prince by Holly Black, which may not seem like a big deal to anyone, but I have said multiple times that I was never going to read this book. I think I even have video evidence on my channel of me saying that I was never going to read this book. I'm not like the most interested in The Cruel Prince trilogy. <laughs> so the first question is a popular book everybody loves that you have no interest in reading. So the first book that kind of came to mind was The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. And now here we are and I'm reading it. <laughs> I really could only read this book if I was vlogging it. That was the only way I was going to get myself to ever read this. And because this also has become so popular on Book Talk, this just seemed like the perfect opportunity. So I haven't started it yet, but I just felt like I needed to document the fact that I am about to read this book. That came out, when did this book come out actually? 2018. This came out in 2018. And since 2018, I've been saying that I didn't really have an interest, which is so strange because especially around that time, YA fantasy with Faye, like I should have been interested in it, but for some reason I just never really was and I just never felt drawn to picking this book up, so I never did. So we will see how this goes. I really have no idea if I'm gonna like it or not and I honestly think I will laugh so hard if I end up liking it because that's just like classic me problems, like putting off consuming some sort of media of any kind for years and years, and then finally, you know, reading it or watching it or whatever it may be and really loving it. That has happened many a time, so I'm just gonna laugh if that happens with this. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to update on some initial thoughts on The Cruel Prince. I also give a description of the book. I imagine people know at this point what this book is about. To be honest, somehow I didn't really even know. <laughs> and I've heard this book being talked about since it came out like years ago. So it's following Jude and her two sisters. One is her twin and then one is a little older than her. And when they were younger, they got stolen away and taken to Fairy. And now that's where they've kind of grown up. And now this book is taking place like 10 years after that. And Jude is really trying to find her place there and trying to find a place at the court because she just wants to like fit in, especially now that that's like what she's grown up knowing. She doesn't really want to go back to the mortal world. And that's as far really as I've gotten. I'm not that far. I don't really know where things go from there. I have met Cardin. He's not a very nice man, but I mean, he's a cruel prince. That's the whole point. I kind of expected him to not be very nice. <laughs> and to be honest, I don't know how I feel about it. I am 20% of the way through the book. So I'm still kind of at the beginning. I'm about to read chapter nine. So I don't have that many thoughts. I don't know if I'm liking it or not liking it. It's definitely not what I expected though. I don't know what I did expect, but I don't know. I just expected it to be like, just like a fantasy. Like obviously Jude and her sisters were taken from the mortal world and brought to fairy, but I didn't expect the like mortal world, our world to still be like relevant and take like a part of the story. Like there's a part where Jude and her sisters go, they leave fairy to go to the mortal world and they go to the mall, which is just like really jarring to read. Like you go from reading about them being like underground in this fairyland and magic and all of these like different creatures and these people who have like feathers and Cardin in his tail that he, I know he has, I think, and just like things like that to then they just go to the mall and go to the Apple store and it's like, what? <laughs> it just was a bit jarring, especially because I wasn't expecting it. It was kind of cool though because the mall that they go to is a mall in Maine and they go to Newbury Comics and I'm like, wow, love the New England representation. <laughs> so yeah, it was just like a bit jarring because I just wasn't expecting it, but I, I don't know, like I was saying, I don't really have like thoughts one more or the other. I'm feeling pretty neutral on it so far. I'm not hating it. The writing is fine. Jude is kind of a baddie, so love that. But so far, I am not having a bad time. I'm not having like the best time either, but I'm not having a bad time. Like it's very fine. So we'll see what ends up happening because obviously I'm still pretty close to the beginning and I don't really know what the main like plot is going to be yet. So we'll see. Well, hello friends. So I just want to give a little quick update on The Cruel Prince because I think I'm going to be finishing it today or trying to finish it today. So I want to give some thoughts at where I'm at right now just before I finish. I'm now 63% of the way through the book, which is the start of book two. So 
part two. And I will say, the way part one ended, kind of wild. <laughs> I definitely feel like it was being built up that something was going to be happening at the end of part one and that there was going to be something happening at this particular event, but I didn't quite expect the extent of which things happened so that was kind of interesting to read i was kind of stressed actually reading it i think my like investment with this book so far has been regarding like the politics the king in this world the high king he is abdicating his throne and it doesn't necessarily mean that is going to go to his firstborn child it can be like anyone he can choose not just anyone but like he can choose which of his children will take the throne after him and I think it's really interesting how Jude herself has gotten like involved in the high court and into all of these politics and especially after like the events of the end of part one and what has happened there I'm very interested to see how her role in all of it like continues on and what she's going to do going forward so definitely a bit of political intrigue and I'm definitely like interested in that I do think that that's something that I enjoy in like fantasy books is the kind of politics of the world and everything so I am enjoying that aspect I still feel like pretty neutral on the book I feel like that's been how I've been describing my thoughts the whole time I've been reading it <laughs> I'm not loving it but I'm not hating it I feel like if I had to give it a rating right now it'd probably be like a three maybe a three and a half I don't know like somewhere in that range like it's definitely fine I'm not loving it but I'm like intrigued enough to keep reading and I feel like I'm at a point where I could potentially see myself like continuing on with the series. I think there's only two other books and then there's also a novella or something that takes place between the first and second book. So I don't know, like I wouldn't be against continuing with the series, but I'm going to see how this ends and see what happens from here. <laughs> but I'm definitely like interested in the plot and Jude as a character, she's still being a baddie. <laughs> I still really like her character. Even though sometimes she makes really not smart decisions, I think sometimes she has like the right like motivation behind it or her heart's in the right place or like she's just defending herself but it does get her into some interesting situations. <laughs> but I do like her character and I'm excited to see what kind of happens with her character and her involvement in the high court and everything and how that continues from this point on. Well, I've now finished The Cruel Prince and I have to say, maybe some of y'all made some points. <laughs> so yeah, at the end of this, I did end up enjoying the book. I wouldn't say it's like a new favorite that I'm obsessed, but I did like it. I think the second half really made me actually start to feel more invested in the characters and what was going on, and I was just enjoying that second half a lot more. That definitely was something that I struggled with a little bit was getting into this book because like the first like 50% of this book is a lot more slow. There's not as much happening. It's a lot of setup and world building. You're getting to know all of the like politics and the characters and all of the different dynamics and relationships between the characters and it's just like a lot of setup whereas once you get kind of past that halfway point there's actually like things going on and things are happening to the characters and all of that so I will say the first half was definitely not like my favorite but it really did pick up in the second half. I did find the kind of more specific mentions of like the mortal world to be a little jarring and would kind of like take me out of the story. It didn't happen that much. The mortal world is mentioned a lot throughout the book but the specific like references or the characters being there really didn't happen that often but when it did it kind of took me out of it. <laughs> like I mentioned earlier I think that they went to like the mall and we're talking about like the Apple store and Uber comics and things like that. I was like this is just so weird to go from being in fairy where there's like magical creatures and magic and these like high fae and these courts and all of this stuff and then you're just at the mall. And then there was another part where they were talking very much like the politics were becoming a very big part of the plot and they were talking about like the High King and all of this stuff and then the next chapter Judas like, I'm walking down the Isle of Target. It's like, what? <laughs> it just was very jarring and would take me a minute to like completely readjust where my mind was. It was just very weird to go from a very fantastical setting to the Isles of Target. <laughs> oh, and like Jude's dad, his name is Justin. And when that was said, I was like, his name is Justin. All of these like fantasy names in this world. And then her dad's name is Justin. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> 
So yeah, that definitely like took me out of the story, but it didn't happen that often. I think those are the only times that it did happen. So the ones I've already talked about. So it wasn't like it was happening frequently and I was frequently being taken out of the story, but it was just enough where I was like, this is very strange. <laughs> but into like the things I did like, I really did like the politics and how Jude herself got involved in all of that. Like I really liked reading about that. I thought it was really interesting the way things kind of played out in the second half of the book, where things went, Jude kind of scheming, and how the politics play such a big role in this book. And I think throughout the rest of the series it is very like political. I think the second book I think is really focused on that, I think, if I'm remembering what people say correctly, which does intrigue me to continue on with the series, which I think the fact that I am interested in continuing on is a good sign that I enjoyed it enough to want to see where it goes. I feel like the ending of this book has me definitely interested to see what kind of happens next. Also the fact that Holly Black announced like I think a couple days before I started reading The Cruel Prince that she's writing another duology set in this world and it's following a specific character and just seeing what we kind of learn about that character in this first book. I haven't even finished the trilogy and I just based off of this first book I'm interested in that duology and what she's going to do with that so I definitely feel like I'm gonna continue on. So yeah the kind of world and the politics and everything within this like fairy world I find very interesting. As for the characters especially Jude and Cardin specifically because they're like the main characters of this series and the ones that everyone talks about I do really like Jude. I think she makes a lot of, well not a lot, but some questionable decisions, but I think her like motivations and her need for power, it starts off at such an interesting place where she's like, I just want to have enough power where people will stop picking on me, where I can kind of fit in. I won't be just viewed as this mortal who doesn't belong here. But then to see that kind of grow and evolve throughout the book was really interesting and it also like influenced her decisions and her motivations throughout the book and I just think she's a very interesting character to be in the mind of. And obviously she's not like a perfect character. She makes some dumb decisions, but I still find her really interesting. And as for Cardin, like I was halfway through this book and I was like, I don't understand why everyone loves him. I know I was only halfway through the very first book in this series, but I was like, I don't get it. He's mean. And I know the book is called The Cruel Prince, but he's cruel. He was not very nice. <laughs> but then you start to see more of him in the second half and you also start to see his dynamic with Jude, which I did like. I really liked seeing their dynamic, the fact that they don't really get along and that they hate each other, but also like, do they? And I just loved the kind of jokes, like he got jokes, he's funny. <laughs> so I'm still not obsessed with Cardin, but I've still only read the first book. Time could change that if I continue on with the series, but I do understand why. At first I was like, I'm not seeing enough of this character to understand it, and he's being mean. <laughs> but I am interested by his character and I love his dynamic with Jude, that is just... I can understand why people are like obsessed with them as like a couple because they made several points. So yeah, I did really enjoy this. I think I'm gonna give it three and a half stars. I think just because I wasn't as into the first half of this book, whereas the second half was a lot better and I was a lot more invested and enjoying it just a lot more. So I think a three and a half is kind of the perfect like middle as to where I was feeling with this whole entire book. I'm very happy with that. I didn't go into this book like not expecting to like it. That's not why I never wanted to read this book because I figured I would or at least somewhat enjoy it because it definitely was up my alley especially when it was released. It was just one of those books I was never that interested in, so I just never picked it up. But I ended up enjoying it, and I can potentially see myself reading the rest of the series, so it's just classic me that I put off reading something that I'm enjoying, and also just being late to something that is very popular and actually enjoying it when I should have just listened to everyone earlier. It's fine, but three and a half stars. I'm happy that I read this and that I enjoyed it. I was gonna be upset if I didn't like it after all this time of me not reading it. And then if I read it and didn't like it, I would have just been validated in my feelings. But I'm happy that I ended up liking it. So three and a half stars, very happy with that. And we'll see when I end up continuing with the series because I don't think it's an if, I think it's a when. <laughs> We're going to ignore my appearance. Thank you in advance. <laughs> but I have not only started, but have made a decent amount of progress in my next book for this vlog, so I thought I probably should give you all an update. So I did start Beach Read by Emily Henry, and I think Emily Henry's like romance books in general are pretty popular on BookTok. Like I know I've seen 
all of them on BookTok, like even Book Lovers, which is still like a pretty new release, like I'm seeing that everywhere. <laughs> I do think that People We Meet on Vacation is like the more popular BookTok book, but I have seen Beach Read show up there and on like BookTok lists and recommendations and things like that. So I started with this because this was the first one that she published and I wanted to go in order. Anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> but this book here following January, who is a romance author, and she goes to this like beach house, or I think, is it a lake house? I don't even know if it's on the beach. But she goes to this house to kind of do like a writer's retreat because she has to have a book written in the next three months. That's when her like editor is expecting it. But she's really struggling to write this book because of certain life events that have happened to her recently. And there's also a lot of mixed motions with the like lake house in general. And she's having just a hard time writing a romance book when her views and her way of thinking of romance and relationships has been challenged and been changed. So she's really struggling. And her next door neighbor is Augustus or Gus, and he's also an author but he writes literary fiction and he's also struggling to write his book. And something in the description that I think is a little misleading, they don't tell you in the description that they knew each other before like moving in and being neighbors or her finding out that they were neighbors. Like they went to college together and were kind of rivals in college, but now are living next door to each other. They're both authors and they're both really struggling to write their current books. So they decide to switch genres. He will write a romance book and she'll write a literary fiction and they kind of have this deal to see who will get a book deal first. And so far, like I said, I've read a decent amount of this book already. I think I'm like 58% of the way through. I just checked and I already forget. <laughs> yeah, I'm 58% of the way through the book. So I am a decent amount of the way through the book and I am really enjoying it. I feel like just right from the start, the dynamic between Gus and January is so good. The banter and just like them like kind of picking on each other, but it's just like it was so good and so funny like this book like within the first few chapters I was laughing a lot like it is very funny in my opinion and I think their dynamic is also just really great and like the things that they say to each other is really funny I will say that this book is kind of more serious like it has some more like heavier things happening like these characters have both experienced loss and it's like in different ways and in different capacities but it's they both still experienced loss in their life and they're both really struggling and i think that's like a big factor as to why they aren't really able to write in the way that they want and they're both just having like a hard time and even though their dynamic and everything is so fun sometimes they're also talking to each other about the more difficult things that they've experienced and what they're kind of going through so this book is funny but it's also already made me cry so I'm like it's kind of a mix of both so I would say like don't go into this book just expecting a really like light and fluffy rom-com because it has those moments but that's not all it is but I am liking that dynamic I like that they're kind of able to joke around with each other but also have more serious and like open discussions with one another specifically about the things that they're kind of struggling with so I'm just really liking their dynamic as a whole they're banter and everything within the first like few chapters I was already obsessed with like it made me instantly invested in their relationship so I'm like I've just been loving reading about them because I was instantly connected with them and there's also like a small detail of this book where because they're neighbors and like the way that their houses are set up they both have windows that kind of line up with each other and when they're sitting in their seats in their kitchen they kind of like face each other they like will write on notebook paper and like write notes to each other and hold them up and the first time they did that I was like this is like the Taylor Swift You Belong With Me music video. I was absolutely loving it. And then like a couple lines later, January had written down like this reminds me of a Taylor Swift music video and held it up. And I was like, wow, a Taylor Swift reference. That's just like everything to me. <laughs> I'm not like the biggest fan of pop culture references in books. I think it kind of depends on what they are and how the author like writes them into the story because sometimes it feels like they're just there to be there there's no reason for it but i don't mind them all the time but my tolerance for like taylor swift references <laughs> is much higher you can mention taylor swift like every other page in your book and i would never have a problem with it <laughs> but yeah so far i'm loving this it's making me laugh it's making me cry it's made me invested in this relationship like super early on so i'm just having the best time <laughs> reading Beach Read and I loved it so much. <laughs> uh, 
wow. I feel like this is one of those books that I just absolutely loved, but I like, I don't even know what to really say about it. Like sometimes I just love books and give them five stars and they're everything, but I can't explain why. Sometimes when like you don't like something about a book, like you at least have that to talk about like this. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it was just so good. I just, I think a big reason why I love this book is that it made me feel so many things because I really connected with the characters. I think like within the first like handful of chapters, I was really connected with the characters and their relationship. And I loved just the dynamic between Gus and January. I think like the more like happier, lighter moments, the funny moments, the like happy points in their relationship and things moving forward in that way was so funny and so cute. And just like, I absolutely loved those moments, but I also really loved the moments where they were kind of discussing the things that they were struggling with because both of them have kind of experienced a loss in different ways but a loss nonetheless and they are both having like their views on love and relationships kind of challenged while also struggling with what they're going through and they just had so many good moments together like communicating about that but also just like emotional moments where they would be upset and then I would be upset like there was one moment where January was confiding in Gus about things that were happening to her and she was crying and then all of a sudden I was like my face is wet. I'm crying. When did that happen? <laughs> so it just made me feel so many things because I really connected with the characters and their relationship and their dynamic. And that's exactly like what I want with a romance. And even like the third act breakup, the third act conflict, I guess, like, because we're in January's head, we see why she is like giving him space and why she may be like upset about certain things. And I think it made a lot of sense with the situations that they were in, but I just think the third act conflict like actually made sense. I can understand their like perspective and their reasoning for feeling the way that they were. So I just, everything, everything about it was so good. And like the whole ending and the happy for now thing, oh God, <laughs> I'm gonna start crying just talking about it. <laughs> It was a book I didn't want to be over. I just, I loved it so much. But yeah, it just, it was very emotional in so many ways. And it just made me so happy. I just loved it. Like, that's really it. That's really all I have to say. <laughs> So I have started the final book for this book talk vlog and that book is The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. So this is like a YA, I don't even know if it's like a mystery or thriller or like a just kind of like a contemporary book. I'm not quite sure if it's going to be like super mysterious. I'm not quite sure, but you're following this character. I believe her name is Avery. Yes, Avery. So she is someone that like she's lost her mom. She's living with her sister who they like have the same dad but different moms and her sister's in an abusive relationship and she just doesn't have a lot of money. She's really just trying to get through school, get a scholarship so that she can like better her future. But then she finds out that she has been named in a very, 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 very rich man's will and she has no idea who this person is. She has never met this man, but he has basically given her like all of his money <laughs> and not only his money but like everything like his hotels his planes his house his house is <laughs> like everything has gone to her pretty much and the family the hawthorne family his like daughters and grandsons they're supposed to live in the house for like a year that's like a part of the condition on her like keeping her fortune and keeping all of the things that he's given her so she's living in this house with them and she's like why why did this random person give me all of this why did he leave me in his will i've never even met him and now she's having this conflict with his family who are bitter that they barely got anything and this random stranger got everything and I don't know how I'm feeling about it so far because I'm only 23% of the way through. It's definitely a very intriguing concept and so far I like Avery as a character. I'm definitely like interested to find out why she was listed in his will and why she has gotten everything. Definitely an interesting concept and it's interesting the way the different family members are reacting. Some are just as confused as her but aren't taking it out on her. Some of them are. Some think she has like this grand plan like she's a part of this scheme and she's just as confused like she doesn't know what's going on so I'm interested to see where it goes how people continue to treat Avery because of this and I'm just really interested to see how Avery kind of connects and why she was left everything because I really have no prediction I'm only 23% of the way in so who knows 
but I really just want to know why that's the case. I'm also a little concerned though because this is like a series. I think, I know there's at least a second book. There may be a third one coming out or I'm not entirely sure. So I'm a little concerned that because it's a series we're not going to find out why she was left in the will in this first book because if I don't like it then I'm not going to want to continue on with the series but I also kind of want to know. But maybe I'll enjoy it and then I'll continue on. Honestly, only time will tell but we'll see how that goes. I, I know there's at least a sequel. I don't know how many books there are but we'll see. So far it's very fine. I'm having a good time, interested to see where it goes, and it's very like fast paced. The chapters are very short, which I appreciate. I think when chapters are really short it keeps motivating me to like keep reading. So I'm like, oh it's only three pages, let me keep reading. So I'm hoping to get through it pretty quickly, um, but so far it's fine. I'm excited to see where it goes, and that's really all I can say right now. <laughs> Okay, so I finished the inheritance games, wanted to give some final thoughts. I think overall this was a pretty average solid read. It didn't do anything that absolutely blew me away and that I was absolutely obsessed with, but it didn't do anything that I was like, oh this is bad, like I don't like this. It was pretty much right in the middle. This book is mainly a mystery. It's mainly Avery and all of these characters trying to figure out why she was the one who inherited this very very wealthy man's money, houses, everything. She inherited everything from him and or almost everything and this book is just like trying to understand why and the guy who passed was actually very like he made his grandsons who are the like boys that are around Avery's age he made them play all of these games there's a lot of like secret passageways within the house that she inherited like there's a lot of games that they have grown up playing so they think that she's just another game and they're trying to kind of solve all of these different puzzles into why she was chosen and so I really appreciated that this mystery wasn't super obvious at least to me. I didn't predict really anything that was revealed at any point in this book. I still at this point do not know where it's gonna go because in this book you don't get all of the answers. You get some reveals and some answers but you don't get everything because this is a trilogy so it didn't wrap up in this book. So I really like that especially because I feel like with a lot of like adult thrillers and or mysteries I figure them out pretty early on and I don't know why. I don't know why my brain works that way. But with this I really had no idea where I was going so I really appreciated that. And like I was saying you don't get all of the answers at the end of this book. You get some reveals that kind of make you feel satisfied in some way by the end of this book. Like you didn't read this whole book just to get nothing. It does make you feel satisfied in certain ways you've gotten some answers but it also makes you more interested to continue on. So I think she did a really good job of writing the book in that way and revealing certain things in ways that make you want to continue on reading. A part of me is just like I wish I just knew what happened because I I don't know I understand that it's a trilogy and she wasn't going to reveal everything in this first book but a part of me just like I just want to know but that's more of a B problem. I understand why she wrote it this way if it's a trilogy. So again that's more of a me thing just wanting to know all the answers but I do think it was paced really well and you were given certain reveals at certain points that made sense that will keep you interested enough to continue on but also satisfied by the end of this book. I will say there definitely were some slower moments in this book. I think a lot of the times that it slowed down and we were taken out of like the mystery aspect of this book was when the author was trying to forward the romance with Avery and a couple of these characters there is a bit of a love triangle happening in this book which doesn't really bother me. I don't really care one way or the other for love triangles. I think it kind of depends on how they're done but I didn't really care about the romance just as a whole and in general but that might also just be because I'm not necessarily the target audience for this book. I am a bit older than the target audience for this novel so maybe that's why I think maybe if I was a bit younger maybe I'd be a little bit more invested in the romance. I don't know. So yeah I just didn't love those moments where we were kind of slowing down for the sake of this love triangle because I just didn't really care and I just wanted to be back with like figuring out the mystery and everything. So yeah overall it was a pretty solid read. It didn't do anything that really blew me away like I said but it was fine. It didn't do anything that like offended me either. <laughs> I thought the writing was fine. It was very simple but it was fine. There wasn't anything that I had any issues with with the writing. I thought the characters were interesting. I thought the mystery was also intriguing and I liked that I wasn't able to predict exactly where everything was going and I still like have no idea where the rest of the series is gonna go. And I also did end up placing a hold on the second book in the series so that probably counts for something. I am definitely interested in seeing where this mystery goes and why Avery was chosen to inherit everything 
everything. Like that definitely has me intrigued. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, but I think I'm going to give this one a three star. It was a very solid read, like I said. And I also think that this book is being adapted into a TV series. And I think that that makes so much sense. The whole time I was reading this book, I was so clearly visualizing certain scenes in like a TV show or a movie. Like I just think that this is the type of book that would make a great adaptation with the whole premise of this mystery. And I think because it has a romance and because of all of the weird games and puzzles and the secret passageways and all of these things in this house and just certain like very exciting like action E scenes. <laughs> I just think that this would make a great adaptation. So I'm excited to see what ends up happening with that. So yeah, overall a three star read, had a decent time reading it, and I'm still definitely intrigued to see where the rest of the mystery goes. All right, so that is it. Those are all of the books I read for this video, the five popular book talk books that I wanted to read for this video, and definitely had a variety of opinions and a variety of outcomes with these books. We had a couple five stars, we had a couple three stars, and we even had a one star. So we were kind of all across the board with these books. And even though From Blood and Ash was a one star and is probably my like least favorite book that I've read so far this year, I did have two five star reads and both of those are probably going to end up on my favorite books of the year list. So I think it kind of evens out and I would say this was relatively successful. And even the two three star books are a part of series that I would be down to continuing on with and read the rest of the books in the series. So I think that that is a win, especially with The Cruel Prince. That is a book that I have said on so many occasions that I never want to read. And now I've not only read the first book, I enjoyed it enough to want to continue on with the series. So I would say this was a pretty successful video. It ignoring the one star, but everything else was fine. <laughs> And something I kind of wanted to quickly acknowledge was when I was reading through these books and looking through my TBR, I realized something and that is that it's very white. <laughs> a lot of these authors are white and there's not a whole lot of diversity within these stories. And that's on me for not choosing better books for this TBR. But it is also something to be said that when you do search popular book talk books on Google, when you look at these articles, when you go on the Barnes and Noble website or you see their displays of popular book talk books, this is kind of the general idea. There's not a whole lot of diversity within the authors and the stories that are being recommended and are considered the very popular book talk books. And I'm not trying to divert the blame for me picking this particular TBR, but it is something to be said when you Google it. There's not a whole lot of diversity happening. And obviously this is not like the end all be all of all popular book talk recommendations and book talkers in general. There are so many people on book talk. It is a huge a community of people over there and there is a variety of people recommending a variety of things. So I don't want to be like this is the only thing that's being recommended because that's not true. But the books that are considered popular book talk books are definitely lacking in some more inclusivity and diversity and from marginalized authors. So I hope that that's something that as book talk continues that kind of changes because book talk is so influential at the moment. They are not just influential with the bookish community in general but like the industry, the publishing industry as a whole. You see, you go to like a bookstore and you see TikTok sensation on some of these books. Like you get those stickers on the books. So it's definitely a very powerful platform right now within the bookish community. I just think it would be so great to see more diversity within these popular book talk recommendations lists and I think it would just make a big difference. I think it would be so cool to see. That's something that I just kind of wanted to acknowledge within this video because of my specific TBR. I think there's a bigger conversation that can be had about book talk and its influence and the recommendations and the types of authors and stories that are being recommended on there, but I just really wanted to acknowledge it slightly because of the specific TBR that I chose for this video. But yeah, just something to think about, just some food for thought. Uh, I just think it'd be really great to see Book Talk using their influence to boost stories from authors that don't have necessarily the same opportunities as their white peers in this industry. So that's all. But that is it for this video. I would love to do like a part two of this where I read more popular Book Talk books and maybe choose a better TBR for this video. Maybe just focusing on like BIPOC authors. I think that that would be really, really great. So definitely let me know if you'd like to see that. And also let me know if you've read any of these books, your thoughts, any books on Book Talk that are really popular that you would recommend. I'd love to know any of your thoughts and recommendations down below. But I think that that is going to be it for this video. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.